Let's go to our panel now from Stockholm. We have the first secretary of the Eritrean Embassy in Sweden, Sirak Balbi. In the Dutch city of Leiden, Daniel McConnan, the executive director of the Eritrean Law Society. And in Cambridge, African politics analyst Goitam Gebreluel. I thank you all for joining us, gentlemen. Goitam, let me start with you. Tens of thousands dead, decades of war. Now there's peace, there's a handshake, there's goodwill. Is it all over? Um, that's the big question. Um, the rapprochement came very sudden, and uh, the public has not been given any information on the substance of the negotiations, what the outstanding issues were, whether they've been solved or anything. We just, um, you know, there were some symbolic gestures, uh, declaration from Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed that he would accept the uh, uh, demarcation of the border. It was accepted by Saeed Saforki. And then now everyone is acting as if uh, we haven't been in a state of rivalry for 17 years. Um, it's very positive that these measures have been taken and that we are where we are. But it would be more reassuring if we could get some substantive, um, you know, information as to how this relationship has reached where it is now right. of the last uh, okay. you know, a week or so. Okay. And, okay. Uh, okay. Hold that yeah. for a second. Okay. We're going to come back to you, Sirak Balbi. Are you happy? I'm very, very happy. Uh, this peace has been attained after a lot of sacrifices have been made. A lot of people have paid uh, their lives, their uh, opportunities. A lot of things has happened over the last 20 years. So when you see the two leaders signing a peace declaration ending 20 years of misery. I am very, very happy for the people who have suffered. Uh, and peace is probably the most important ingredient for anybody or any nation to stabilize their people and to uh, uh, develop their nations. So I'm very happy today. Right. It's a joyous moment. I think the Eritrean people are very happy as we saw and witnessed on the Sunday when the right. Prime Minister Abiy has arrived in Asmara. Right. So, Sirak, would you accept then, because you've said there have been a lot of sacrifices, a lot of people have given their lives, it's been a terrible state of conflict, would you accept that a lot of the sacrifices now in order to make yes. peace have to come from Eritrea? Because the very nature of the country, it being very much a martial state, Human Rights Watch calls it a one-man dictatorship, the human rights record is not good. Do you accept that your country has to make a lot of the sacrifices now moving forward in order to ensure that peace is sustainable? No, uh, it's not quite uh, a true uh, information uh, that you are giving out. Uh, I know the media and uh, other institutions are very quick to, uh, uh, to paint Eritrea as, as you've described it, but... Um, the very, the very uh, thing that we're witnessing uh, at the moment, Certainly. you see that Eritrea has totally. been working I, for peace, absolutely so. for defending and itself. And this is great. And this is what, and, 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 and I'm sorry to interrupt you. And I know there's a slight delay, so I know the interruption is annoying because there's a slight delay. But let me put it to you this way: You're saying okay. media is trying to, you know, give false information. I'm not quoting the media here respectfully. I'm quoting Human Rights Watch, and I'm quoting the mm -hmm. UN Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights. So granted, moving forward, yes, this is possibly fantastic. Human Rights Watch in their 2018 report says Isaias Apoerki is a one-man dictatorship. The UN Commission of Inquiry in 2016 says Eritrea is committing crimes against humanity with up to 400,000 people enslaved. They use the words, not mine. They're not the media, they're UN Commission of Inquiry on Human Rights. So again, this is wonderful that there's a handshake. There's a, it's wonderful that yeah. Badme has been possibly resolved. But I ask you, don't you have to now make the sacrifices as Eritrea in order to open up now that you have possible peace with Ethiopia? Well, yeah, that's what I was trying to answer. I think uh, even though the Commission of Inquiry of the United Nations was found uh, to be a baseless accusations, it's uh, clearly, I mean, uh, the, uh, the Commission of Inquiry, uh, first of all, it was based, uh, it was formed on a politically motivated uh, uh, situation, and uh, all the reports are incredibly, uh, you know, 
uh, basically false. I, I really don't want to go back to that because we can talk a lot about it. Uh, Eritrea, at this right, at this moment, uh, the Prime Minister Abiy, uh, Prime Minister of Ethiopia, actually said in his speech that he has got a lot to learn from President Isaias Aforki. Uh, so that just that statement actually proves that a lot, that the, 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 the way they have been depicting the media, the United Nations, I mean, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, sanctions are being put on Eritrea twice right. uh, by, um, uh, supported by the United, States, the United States. But the very day the peace declaration was signed on Monday, the very afternoon, Prime Minister Abiy went to the Secretary General of United Nations and he told them to lift the sanctions against okay, Eritrea. Okay, okay, so, fair enough. Okay, uh, so, Sirak, let me bring in Daniel McConnell. Kata Category oh. reje okay. reject. Yeah. Fair enough. So you, you reject the accusations, the human rights accusations, because a lot of the discussion here is about what will Absolutely. Eritrea do? Will it bend in order to make peace happen? You're saying it's not even happening, the human rights um, abuses. Daniel McConnell. So we've looked at... The cautious optimism of Goitom saying, okay, this is good news, but let's wait and see. And we've got a lot of optimism from Sirak, but he's saying that Eritrea doesn't necessarily have to get its house in order. How do you feel about that? Uh, thank you for having me, Imran. Um, it's good to have or to witness the kind of gesture that's coming from uh, both governments in Ethiopia and in Eritrea by way of resolving what has been described as a no peace, no war situation of the last 16 to 17 years. Um, this is good, but one needs to ask a question, a very important question, that is it possible to have peace with your neighbors when you don't have peace at home, peace with your own people? And I heard Sirak Bahadabi talking about the report of the Commission of Inquiry, discrediting the report and sometimes even confusing that report with the other uh, sanctions against Eritrea. And there are two different processes to start with. And to say that there are no human rights violations in Eritrea happening now for the last many years is actually an insult to the victims of human rights violations. So we need to be clear. It's good to see the two governments coming together trying to resolve their problems in a civilized way, something that should have been done actually 20 years ago. It's another thing to argue and request and demand the Eritrean government to do its own homework at home. Right. We are speaking about a country, we need to remember this, a country which does not have a working constitution, a country which does not have a functioning parliament. Okay, okay. so let me, this okay, so Daniel, because in the interest of time, certainly, certainly, and, and points okay. well made. I'm going to come back to you, Goitom, in a, in a moment, but I want to get Sirak to respond to this. Sirak, you want to respond to Daniel? The, yeah, Daniel Mokonnen is one of the people who was working with the former Ethiopian government to uh, draft the Commission of Inquiry report. I saw him myself. He was working with the Ethiopian ambassador in the United Nations to actually pass, to pass this paper to, uh, to, to, make, uh, to make life difficult in Eritrea. So he's a very biased. He cannot actually talk about these kind of things. Eritrea did what it did to defend itself. Uh, and now we can see it in our, within our, uh, with our own eyes that we have been exonerated. We had to defend our country against a brutal regime, against a regime that had the support of the United States. So some of the civil liberties were being curtailed. Once peace has been achieved, of course, we need to look at our uh, nation, we need to build our nation, but peace and, peace and stability is one of the okay. most so, important ingredients, okay, so let me, and we okay, have been okay, working for enough. this moment so let me go for to a lot of time. Okay. And then, okay, let me go to Goitem. Goitem Gabriel Luel. So we're, we're hearing from the Eritrean embassy in Sweden, essentially, that given that the Ethiopians have held out the olive branch, this is a good opportunity for peace. The problem in the past was the brutality of the Ethiopians. What does that tell you about the prospects for peace and a sustainable peace? Um, I'm a bit worried, to be honest, because uh, the current uh, dynamics are uncannily similar to uh, what went on in 1991 when uh, the last uh, communist regime in Ethiopia was overthrown. 
Uh, at that point, there was a lot of, you know, uh, hysteria. We had two charismatic leaders. They were being branded as the new generation of African leaders. Um, there was talk about Eritrea and Ethiopia being uh, one people with two governments, and the two governments, uh, you know, eagerly um, went on to integrate their economies. There were free movement of people, free movement of goods. Um, and we had the worst, the most deadly uh, war, interstate war in African history mm -hmm. in a context of extensive economic interdependence and social integration. Um, and I think one of the enabling factors was that the relationship had not been institutionalized. Uh, it was, you know, it was based on a lot of sentiment. It was run by two charismatic leaders. Um, and so we need to have that history in mind and draw some lessons from that. And so I think it's important that moving on, uh, first of all, we shouldn't uh, you know, one of the similarities to the past is that everyone blamed the Derg for, or well, that is the Ethiopian communist regime, for all the conflict in the past. So they thought that once the Derg was away, peace would naturally occur. Right. Now there's a similar type of rhetoric where uh, the last government in Ethiopia, or it's a similar part, the same party, but the last uh, leadership is blamed for everything. And okay. now that that's but out of the way, Gautam, let me ask peace you, will naturally Let me ask occur. you, because you're, you're, you are cautiously mm. optimistic, right? You're saying there's a lot of sim symbolism, but not mm -hmm. a lot of detail. But when we look at some of the details, when we look at the fact that now, you know, Ethiopian airlines will be flying to Asmara, mm. when we look at the fact that relatives can call each other, people can, can, can telephone each other as well, across the two countries. Yes, There's yes. the possibility of Ethiopia using Eritrea's port because it's landlocked, right, for business. So these are very tangible things, mm. right? Don't we have to look at it and say, well, you have to start somewhere. Mm. These are happening. They're happening right now. Absolutely. Let's give it a go. Yes, yes. We have to embrace it with open arms. This is fantastic. This was unexpected. But we also have to remember that as I said, the most deadly war in African history occurred in a context of much more economic integration mm -hmm. and social integration and political cooperation than what we have today. Okay. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think we should look to the past to try to learn from it. Okay. And one of the things we can learn from the past is that uh, the relationship was ba based on sentiments and a lot of, you know, uh, assumptions. Uh, and it wasn't sufficiently institutionalized. Right. So I think okay. Okay. it's important that we settle the terms of our future engagement uh, quickly. Okay. Daniel right. McConnell, are we not giving enough credit to Isaiah Safwerki because it takes two to tango? Abi Ahmed, yes, made the gesture, but initially Eritrea was quiet. Afwerki could have stayed at home or he could have said, don't come. He could have. He could have sat down and completely rejected it or ignored it. The ball was in his court. The fact that he actually took the step to embracing this dialogue, should we be giving him credit, even though I know there are many criticisms of the man? Yes, uh, let me make um, a quick correction for a few seconds and I answer your question. I haven't written any report on behalf of the Commission of Inquiry as claimed by Sirak, and this needs to be corrected. With regard to giving credit to both governments, I would say that credit goes to both governments. In fact, this peace, latest peace initiative was taken by the Prime Minister of Ethiopia. What I need to say is it's very good to see that both governments are engaged in this kind of constructive um, uh, development. Uh, we, we acknowledge that, of course, with a certain degree of caution. But there are not institutions in place. There are not democratic, there is no democratic accountability per se in particular in Ethiopia, I mentioned it before, there is not even a duly constituted national assembly or parliament. And what do we do next? One month from now or two months from now, if this government comes back and tells us we don't really care about what's happening between us. That's what happened many years back. We don't have guarantees. It's good to acknowledge the positive developments, but at the same time, it's also important to recognize the shortcomings. Unless these shortcomings are resolved in a very responsible way, peace may not prevail between the two countries in a sustainable way. This is the point I'm trying to make. Okay. Sirak, is that a fair point? 
course not. Uh, I mean, you have to imagine, I mean, I'm willing to uh, uh, learn from the past, learn from the last 20 years, and then move on towards peace and towards uh, uh, prosperity, development, and regional peace as well, not just Eritrean, but the whole region. You have Yemen, you have uh, Sudan, you have Somalia, you have Djibouti, a lot of traveled uh, region that we live. So we, li we need to look forward and we need to learn from the past. But uh, the problem we have is Eritrea has paid quite a lot, as I said. And people like uh, Daniel Mokonen and his likes, they have been an extension of the past ruling party when they were attacking Eritrea. So, I mean, I would expect him and his likes to say sorry because they have, get, they have been getting it wrong of uh, what's been happening, their analysis, uh, their actions have been completely wrong and unacceptable. Now, um, the uh, President Isaias and Prime Minister Abiy have done something like the whole world is actually uh, uh, thanking them, encouraging them, and uh, uh, they have been put as an example. And of course, we have to learn from the past, but uh, what we have witnessed just over the last two weeks is quite an encouraging thing. Uh, Eritrea has been saying that we need to work uh, with Ethiopia since, uh, since our independence, because our region is a very, very important region. It's a strategically located. The whole or the majority of the world economy passes through in front of our doorsteps, so we can do quite a lot if okay. Eritrea and Ethiopia work okay. together. Okay. So a that's what we've been trying. So it's okay. very encouraging. Okay. Daniel McConnell, we're running out of time. Wrap us up here. Daniel, go ahead. Yeah, no, my point is actually, it's not me or somebody else who, have, who should really ask, who should apologize. It's the Eritrean government who should apologize first and foremost for what has been done over the past many years. We have seen this kind of responsible move from the new prime minister of Ethiopia. He has publicly apologized for the past mistakes of the previous governments. We haven't seen up to this moment from the Eritrean government, in particular from President Isaias Akorki. He should follow the same steps, actually. And it's not for me, for an individual person, to ask the, the apology. It should really come from the Eritrean government. And I wanted to make the, the point clear uh, in, in, okay. in this regard. Uh, and uh, only that way, only that way, with a very with a responsible uh, government, with accountability for the people, that we can have sustainable peace between the two countries. Okay, well, we'll be watching very closely. We hope that peace takes root and lasts. We'll be covering the story as it unfolds. But for the moment, uh, gentlemen, I have to thank you. Daniel McConnell, Goitam Gabriel Luel, and Sirak Balbi, thanks for joining us on the Newsmakers. <laughs>